Welcome to Business Amplified with host Kevin A. Dunlap. This podcast is for small business owners aiming to amplify their enterprises. Explore strategies to play a bigger game by becoming an author, public speaker, podcast host, or expanding your brand in other ways. Elevate your business on Business Amplified. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Business Amplified. Today, we're going to have an, another gentleman. I, I can't wait till we actually start uh, getting into our discussion. His name is Matthew. He comes from uh, the the wonderful country of Canada, and I've got a few good Canadian friends. Uh, I mean, I love I love my Canadian friends. So, anyway, without any further ado, let us go ahead and introduce Matthew to the show. So, Matthew, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin, thanks for having me. It's a, it's an honor to be on. So, uh, Matthew, tell me a little bit uh, uh, about yourself. So, who are you? What is it you do? And why is it that you do it? Yeah. Uh, so, right now, I'm a business coach and strategic consultant. Um, I mean, I've been coaching consulting for about 15 years now. But this latest iteration, working with high-level leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, has been about 15 months. And um, the reason that I got into this, I mean, for a long time, I've just loved working with leaders and entrepreneurs and seeing the things that are in their heart actually come to fruition, see them live out their potential, see them actually grow and scale their businesses. And so um, after, you know, starting a few of my own businesses myself and, you know, getting a success, I, I ran a marketing company for, for I think it was almost 10 years, actually. Um, and after a successful exit, I found myself, you know, unsure what I wanted to do next. And this felt like a really natural step. Um, and so I, I started to work with started to tell people, uh, well, I started working with it with a client. We started on that business consulting, business coaching journey, and then started telling people. And next thing you know, I had a bunch of clients and I was really in the rhythm. And I tried to spend the first year, um, last year, just trying to, to get a good feel, get a good bandwidth, get a good baseline, solicit a lot of feedback from people. And, you know, now that we're, we're really in the trenches, I'm just seeing so much and I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm loving what I do. And uh, and what made you decide to get into uh, to, to leave marketing and then go into business coaching? Because I mean, I'm also a business coach myself. Uh, one of the reasons I got into it was because for um, close to 16 years I was in real estate. So I for eight years I was a real estate consultant, and then for eight more years I was a real estate agent as well. And one of the things that I saw was just how many how many times uh, people just don't know what they don't know. So they're trying to guess their way through the the process, um, you know. And, and for them, I mean, I know some of the things. I wish I had a coach earlier because things that took me ten years to learn, I could have learned it in two months. And it was how much time would that have saved? Now that's one of the reasons I got into because when I got out of real estate in 2020, and then I moved from Las Vegas, Nevada to to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina in March of 22. In uh, 21, after COVID, I, I wrote my fourth book called Launch the A to Z and Creating a Successful Business based upon all the seminars, classes, trainings, and stuff that, that I went through. And I said, and I really realized, like, I really want to cut the learning curve down. That's why I got into, uh, it, the reason I got into the business. So what, what what was it about you that got into, the, into your business? And was it anything related to your marketing uh, business that you did prior? Yeah, you know, I, I like to joke with people that I got into the coaching consulting game by accident. I kind of fell into it. But th the truth is, I, I'd always had a passion for business, always had a pa passion for entrepreneurship. Um, I liked marketing. So I did marketing for a bit. And then I got to a point where I said, hey, you know what, I feel bored, I feel kind of stagnant, I want a new challenge. And I didn't know what that was going to be. And uh, so I, I ended up, you know, there's a successful exit, I was like, I'm gonna buy myself some time take a few months, figure things out. And an old client called me and said, Hey, I'd love to work with you. And I had actually dodged their calls for a little bit, mostly because I had said, Hey, you know what? I'm done with marketing. I, I, I need a break. Okay. I, 10 years of ads, SEO strategy. I said, Hey, I, I, I love business. So I want to try something. And so I, I, we kind of played phone tag and until we finally hopped on and you know, this client who's back to being a current client now said, Hey, I actually just loved working with you. I loved the questions you asked. I, I loved, you know, the coaching that you provided. And I think that you'd be really beneficial and an asset to us outside of marketing. And I was both really excited and really terrified at the same time. I was like, I don't know if I'm qualified to do this. And so, you know, we just started. And within a few weeks, I started telling other people and everyone was like, yes, you were made for this. We'd love to hire you. And then we'd love to hire you. And next thing you knew, I, I had a business. 
I knew I was going to start something, but I didn't know that it would come into the coaching and consulting sphere. And, you know, it's, it's over the last 15 months now that I've really started to piece together that this is always, always what I did, right? I was, I've always loved business. I've always loved entrepreneurship. But at the end of the day, I just love working with people and seeing them reach their potential. And I think that's just had different skins over the years. I had the marketing skin for a little bit, did real estate development, still do a little bit. And so no matter the skin, at the end of the day, what I'm doing now has always been at the core of what I love doing. And that's, you know, building people, helping build businesses, helping people see what's actually, you know, in their heart and see, even see that help them see past what's currently in front of them. And so, yeah, that's how I got into it. And um, I, I've realized that it really wasn't an accident. It was very intentional. Uh, and um, where, where it's taking me, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm along for the ride. I'm, I'm loving the journey so far. You know, just say that there's a lot of overlap between the two businesses that you carry, the skills that you had in that one business uh, can translate uh, to this business as well. Uh, totally. And, and I mean, you know this, I'm sure, having been in business for so long. At the end of the day, there's so many things, whether marketing, sales, right? Especially a lot of, you know, small business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs, startups, you're wearing so many hats. So you're learning a little bit of everything, right? You're the, you're the jack or jill of all trades. And so for me, there was carryover. But I think that the main carryover for me that I'm really helping a lot of my clients with is, you know, there's, there's two sides. There's the, there's the strategic thinking vision. You know, I'm a, I'm a dreamer. I'm a big idea guy. And then I also, you know, because of some of the life circumstances that I went through in starting my marketing business, I also had to learn, okay, well, you know what? No, no one's coming to rescue me. Uh, I don't have the budget to, to go hire people. So I've got to build systems. I've got to teach myself what processes look like. I've got to actually put these things in place because if I don't, this thing ain't going to survive. And so those skills now coming in to help my clients, I, I can pretty much say that those two sphere, spheres, uh, the strategic side and the, the operations, structure, systems, processes, those two sides, so much carryover. And I'm seeing that with a lot of my clients and it's why I think I'm able to help them and speak and really empathize with their situations. I know when I was run, running my real estate business, and if anybody's listened to some of my shows before, I've been probably saying a, a similar story all, all over again. But I, I have realized that, you know, whatever uh, my skill sets were in previous jobs and previous endeavors, they they do, they can translate. You may have to tweak them a little bit, but they can translate. And to me, like one of my biggest things that I learned was back in 2009. And and this was I mean this was uh, camcorders were just getting started. I actually went to a real estate seminar. I won a camcorder, and it was a it's one of those little flip camcorders, so you could only record one hour of video. I still have it, by the way, and I have used it. Uh, I still use it, uh, not that often, but I still use it. But when I was running my real estate consultation business and I was marketing a lot of homes. I, I I took the chance, the, the, the risk of, of actually starting recording myself on video. Now I was nervous. I made mistakes and all of that. But now the thing is, I'm so glad that I did that because now when I'm doing a podcast like this or I'm doing a promotion, I, I can easily just put on the, the the microphone and then start shooting video. Uh, and it's because of the, those other skills that seem completely unrelated. The other thing that I think one of my biggest lessons that I learned was back in the early 2000s when I was living in Wilmington, North Carolina. And besides being a college math teacher, a bartender, a real estate investor, one of the other things that I was doing uh, really pushed my comfort zone. It was to do stunt work for film and stage. So, you know, jumping out of the airplane, setting myself on fire, doing something like that. And what I learned was, is, is uh, the biggest thing that I learned, after, and I've given this talk uh, quite a few times, when you're doing, like say, doing stunts or business, it's not about becoming fearless. It's about controlling your fear or acting in spite of that fear. And I mean, I would never would have, I said, who would have thought that me setting myself on fire or me safely hanging myself would be a, a great way to, to overcome that, not overcome, but to, to control that fear. Because if I'm, if I'm about to get paid for a stunt, you know, when, that, when the director says uh, action, you got to go regardless of that fear. 
So the same thing is true in your business. It's like, you know, like you're saying, you're wearing all those hats, but maybe it's time to hire that first employee or the, the, fir the first independent contractor or going on something like a, or getting a VA or something like that. You know, you will have those fears, but you have to act in spite of those fears. And the thing is, whatever your skill sets are now, if you're running a business or you, even if you're still working a day job, you know, how can you use the skill set you have at that job to be that you can incorporate into your business? Now, would, would, you, would you say that's why I was asking you the question about the marketing uh, to your business coaching? I would, would you would, would you agree with me on that uh, by pulling those skills from other and, and just refining them? Oh, totally. I mean, as a quick aside, I feel like you just aged us by saying the word camcorder. So anybody under 30 is sitting there wondering what's a camcorder. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Again, I think it goes back to what I said. For me in starting that marketing business, you know, the, the reason I'd always loved business and entrepreneurship, but I had to start that business. I actually, you know, got into a horrific car accident about 12 years ago, uh, three inches from death, basically. I uh, hit two horses and, you know, the aftermath left me with some injuries, chronic pain, depression, all this stuff. And so that, that corporate job that I had that I loved, that was no longer my reality. I, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, found myself unemployable. Who's going to hire a guy where you don't know if um, I'm going to show up to work one day, if I'm going to miss three, four days. And so I had to start a business. And in what you're saying, there was a whole lot of fears, even though I love business, I love entrepreneurship. There was a whole lot of fears, right? The fear of, you know, if I have another headache or I have chronic pain that knocks me out, am I going to lose clients? Am I going to lose my business? How am I going to survive? How am I going to live? And so a lot of the things you're saying, right? Those skills, I had to learn, right? I, I was a big picture, big details guy. I wasn't, I wasn't a small details structures guy. So, you know, you talk virtual assistants. I had to learn real quick about that world. I had to learn hiring. I had to learn onboarding. I, I, you know, I failed forward a lot. I, I try and tell my clients, I'm like, hey, you know, we, we try in business and make things really binary where it's, you know, pass, fail or success, failure. And I'm like, for me, I had to come to this place where I realized this was a 60% success. That means that there was 40% of failure in this task, but I got 60% success. And so I had now have a baseline. The next time I do that task, it's 70%, it's 80%. But, you know, to go back to what you were saying, so many of these skills that I now find useful in building this business and helping clients, you know, again, right, hiring, sales, what does it look like to have a process to nurture leads, right? Uh, what does it look like to have a system that actually tracks our profits and our revenues and our numbers? And so it, it, it's, it's really interesting that and I'm sure you can speak to this, that it feels like no matter what business you're in and no matter what you start next or what your next adventure is in that world, it feels like there's so many things that you're just building on. You're constantly raising your floor in terms of your business skills. And so much of that is transferable. And I think if people step back and realize it, it's, it's actually truthfully a lot of life skills that are super, super important just to, to level up in life. I remember uh, back in uh, 2016 when I just had my first podcast, it was called Life's Little Lessons. And one of the first, because it was just me talking uh, into the camera, one of the things I learned was you have to be consistent. And I was very inconsistent. So, uh, so I ended up letting, letting that show go. And then in 2017, I had the idea, like, I really like the name Life's Little Lessons, but how can I maintain consistency? And and when I when I once I discovered I had two epiphanies at that moment. The first epiphany was how do I, how can I have uh, how can I have consistent shows and not and not not worry about running out of content. And the idea was interviews. I can have interviews, and then it's the guest that brings in the content. And then my second epiphany was I really like life's little lessons, but if I continue on with that name of that show, they, they already people that may already follow me. So, you know, they'll see me just jumping all over the place. And a moment later, I go, and my second epiphany, season two. I can have season two. The interview. And what that taught me was when I was doing all those shows, I was doing all the editing, video editing, audio editing in the background. And that was a a very uh, time-consuming process. However, in 2022, when I started uh, creating online courses, I already had the, uh, the video and, and audio editing skills. And if I had not had the skills from that previous podcast, I probably would have been stuck in my first or second program. 
So, so the thing is, you know, I, I learned from a previous uh, a, a previous event how to do stuff. And the thing is, yes, I was self taught. Now that we have AI, AI does most of my work for me. But I but, but I still know what what to look for. And uh, it, it was just uh, whatever you call it when you uh, re uh, rehash a skill to, to use it in a, in a different area. Yeah, that's so good. And, and it, like I, I could go on and on about how many times I, I've I've had to do that in my life and things I've had to learn. I, I think one of one of the biggest life lessons that I took was you know I was probably four years post accident, and uh, I was I remember I was you know dealing with all all this stuff, and on top of that, you know I was. Uh, I was very overweight and it was really taking a lot out of my health on top of what I was going through. It was affecting my business, my life, you know, was having trouble breathing, was going to see the doctors. And I started to realize, I said, you know what, there's a lot of things that I can't control. You know, I can't control this pain that I'm dealing with. You know, I can't control when the headaches come on, but this, you know, my health, this area of my health, my weight, this, I can actually, you know, maybe I can control it. And so rather than set some lofty goal, I just told myself, I said, hey, you know what, we're going to take this one day at a time and we're going to be consistent, just like what you said. And, you know, there's this business um, added just axiom that's, you know, you can't manage what you're not measuring, right? And I just started to apply that to the situation and how that changed, not just my health, but my life and my business was revolutionary because I started to say, you know what, we can set goals of, you know, I want to make a million dollars. I want to make $10 million. But at the end of the day, if we don't know what our baseline is, we don't have an idea of what we're actually managing, and we don't have measurements in place, then we're actually just taking a good walk, right? Like we're, we're just we're just trying to aim for a target that isn't um, succinct, it's not precise. And so for me, learning that skill, right? What does it look like to track financials? No one had ever taught me that, right? I, I, I didn't go to school to, to understand what a profit and loss sheet was you know, how to, how to calculate fixed costs. And so I started educating myself in Google, YouTube, just incredible for that. But I really think that so many business people, like you're saying, um, these skills, if we're willing to throw ourselves in, we already wear so many hats as business owners. If we're throw, willing to throw ourselves in and just take it piece by piece, bite by bite, um, it's amazing how five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, those skills, they don't go away. They end up still being incredibly useful. Okay. Yeah, that, and, and that's and, and, and very well said. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Matthew. Um, now, I also like to find out what, uh, either in your marketing business or your current uh, uh, business coaching business, what would you say or has been like one of your, one of your top two uh, biggest challenges and then how did you overcome those? Yeah. I mean, great question. I, I think honestly, one of my biggest challenges um, in, in the marketing business was actually getting clients and not, not just landing sales or, you know, people that want to work with me. It's, it was actually trying to get the clients that I desired to work with, the people that I wanted to actually work with, build relationship with. And I think for me, that was really, really hard in the beginning, because again, I was new to this world and, you know, I, I approached, uh, I tried to adopt a really, really sales centric focus. And so it, it, it took me a while to finally realize that, you know what, if I want to go get the clients that I want, then I need to understand those clients' problems and how they hire and solve for those things. And I started to realize that most of the clients I love working with, they are, they're all almost born out. They're almost all born out of a relationship. And so I started to put myself in positions where I said, you know what, I need to go to places and I need to go to spaces where I can build relationships with people and build trust. And as I provide value, I will land these clients. And, you know, again, my, my current business is a testament to many of those relationships I built on the marketing side, because for me, it's, it's not about running a funnel, right? It's not about clicking yes. And, you know, if you go on Instagram, or you go on LinkedIn, you're getting bombarded with ads. For me, it's okay. If I want to build a predictable and sustainable business, then more than a funnel or a great website, I need to have these strategies and systems in place to go get the type of business and clients I want. And so that was a huge hurdle. And one that, again, I, I had to, I had to educate myself. I had to build some systems out to overcome. And it, it was incredibly difficult until I got that mindset shift. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a big issue with a lot of small business owners is that they're not very clear at what they call a, their ideal client or their avatar. In, in my business, I call it your specific audience. So they're they're, they're trying to uh, please everybody, not realizing that they're they because you say you 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 wanted you wanted to go to places where your uh, a potential client uh, hung out. Because they, you know, and and then you wanted to understand what their problem was, so that you know how to provide a solution for them instead of doing it the other way around, saying, "Hey, let me find my client, and then I'll uh, start uh, working on the problem." Like you, you, know, you thought of the problem first and, and worked it. I don't want to call it backwards, but in the reverse order. Totally, a hundred percent. And 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 I think if if I were to think back to another really profound setback or challenge for me, again, you know, I I was a solopreneur. I had dreams of building a business bigger than that. I'm a solopreneur, got chronic pain, you know, could knock me out at any second. And here's the reality. Nobody's coming to save me. So, you know, if I'm out for a little bit, if my, my head takes me out, my depression, whatever, I could lose my whole business, my whole livelihood. And I think that so many solopreneurs that I meet or even small businesses, if the owner, I mean, I, I was just talking with a client the other day, they've got seven employees, but the owner has their hand in so many pots. That if the owners, I straight up asked the owner, I said, hey, if you were out of commission for a month, what would happen? And they just laughed and said, oh, this business would be done. And I said, great. We just identified a key problem, right? A key thing that we need to structure and build this business so it actually outgrows and outlives you. Otherwise, you're just an employee. And so for me- exactly. So uh, me, I, 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 there's uh, two concepts I, I, I want to uh, harp on it from what, from what you just said. Number one, it says if you're the bottleneck in your business, then everything stops at you. Yeah. So, I mean, and the second thing is I, I often reference a book called uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Uh, have you read that book or any of his series, any of his books? Uh, which is written by Robert Kiyosaki, for those of you who don't know. Uh, in, in his book, he has a, a, a quadrant. He has an E on the top, S on the bottom, B in the top right, and I in the, in the lower right. So E-S-B-I. E is the employee mindset. S is a self-employed mindset. B is a business owner. And I is an investor. Well, let's talk about the, the difference between the S and the B. Because a lot of people think they're a business owner when they're actually self-employed. And it's a completely, completely different mindset. Because like you said, if that uh, one guy has his hands in seven pots and he and his wife says, hey, I need to go to the hospital or whatever. And she has to be has to deal with cancer, you know, family emergency, going on a vacation. And he steps away. That business dies. But the thing is, if he can get, set up his business to the point where it's no longer an S, it actually is a B, then he can step away and hopefully the business will actually even do better without his presence so, totally and and again the only reason why i feel like i can speak to this is because i went through it myself right i, I realized oh. really quickly right I, I realized that hey if if, I, if this doesn't change if i don't do something i'm done and so i had to start you know i laid things out i'm like okay well i know it's just me but let's create an org chart right where do the responsibilities lie for this company is there sales there's marketing and as i started to do that i started to learn okay well you know what let's start to figure out one area. So we'd start to build up some systems. I'd start to build up processes. And sooner rather than later, I'd hire somebody now, you know, even part-time to take that thing on and I'd go to something else. And that's, that's actually how I built my business um, was systemizing it in a way that it basically made this business mat proof. And that's how I hope to help clients is to make the business owner proof. You know, one of my slogans that I use on my, on my website and in my marketing is that I hope to turn business owners from just being operators to owners and from employees to executives. I want to see them regain the status or position in their business that I know, 80-20 rule, at the end of the day, that I want them focused on only the things that require their attention, right? That are the most leveraging. And so it's so interesting how many of us have struggled with that and are still struggling with that. Yeah, uh, and, and I definitely see that with most uh, small business owners or they're a, a one person or two person uh, group is that they uh, they don't know how to uh, let go of the operations. I mean, one of the first things I learned many years ago, back when I was in my, uh, before I became a realtor in 2012, I actually hired a VA and that that lady, which is based on the Philippines, I was in Vegas at the time. 
and I ran a lease option consultation business, a real estate consultation business. And anytime I got a new home, I had to create flyers and all that stuff, shoot video uh, of those uh, of that house. But then I realized what so the flyer is pretty much. If I go there and shoot the video and shoot the pictures and I put it up into a, say a Google Photos the thing, all authors have to do is give the get the V give them the the, the 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 details. They have the images and they can go and create all my marketing campaigns for me. Like, you know, why am I doing all of this stuff? I mean, I could pay somebody else that's like five bucks an hour and she's happy with a five bucks per, uh, per hour in her country. You know, that's how how, how money uh, transfers out over there. And, and I'm saving myself hours and hours uh, every week. Uh, and it's like, okay, now, I'll, so it just saves me time. So the thing is, if you're if you're building a chart, like who's in charge of which departments, now your your first one of your first things you need to do is if you're just starting your business yourself, you you are the, uh, the 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 department head of the marketing, of the sales, of the operations, of the of admin, everything else. But when how can you, when can you start having other people's names in those places? And then you and then you're you're building to the point where you can step away. So, totally. And, and again, I just love that visual. And you know, one of the things I do in my business, I, I, I've come to learn, and I find this successful for me and my clients, is this idea that you know what, everything starts with that org chart, right? The division of responsibilities, and then we have a process from the org chart. We start to say, okay, so we've got a structure. Now we start to ask, okay, well, does this have a job description, right? Is, is there clarity around what? marketing my company looks like, right? Even if I'm doing it, what, what am I responsible for? What's the result I want? And every job description has a workflow, right? Visually, what does A to Z look like? And, and then of course, every workflow has a process. And so there's this four-step process and sooner rather than later, it sounds so daunting, but I've put business owners through it. A lot of business owners that hate administration, I get them to try it. And then they sit there and they say, oh my goodness, I have this clear picture of what I need to do. And and what what I can delegate, because at the end of the day, if we can, if we can hand these things off, right, I, I love to use the analogy of a plate, I think every business owner, their plates full, it's overflowing. And the reality is that you want to take things off your plate, so that you can put more things on your plate for the things that matter, right. So for me, that's I want less broccoli, I want more steak, I'm just being completely honest with you. And so for me, I'm trying to get that broccoli off my plate, and I'm trying to get more steak on my plate. And I think that that visual for people is powerful because they start to realize, man, I really don't like this area or this area is taking up a lot of my time but not giving a lot of return. This is what I'm going to try and offload and outsource. And, uh, and, and this is something I got from another person, a, a previous mentor of mine. And essentially, what he what I said was, uh, you know, what is your what is your hourly wage? What are you? What is your time worth on an hourly basis uh, right now? Give me a number. You know, I don't care what the number is. It could be twenty bucks an hour. It could be a thousand bucks an hour. It doesn't really matter. And the thing is that he said is, um, whatever you know, whatever it's that you're doing that pay that you can hire somebody else to pay that lower dollar amount, pay that lower dollar amount. For an example, the, the example that he used, because uh, he was a public speaker as well as so he was a, a hypnotist, and he says, for an example, like, yeah, how, how much would you pay a maid to clean your house on a weekly basis? No, how many, you know, let's say for five hours a week. He didn't say it's 20 bucks an hour. Okay, so for $100, you can have somebody else clean your house for you. So you're not doing all that work yourself. And therefore, you can use that hour that, that or those those five hours that you paid out 100 bucks for to go and bring in another client that's paying you 1000 So you just 10 extra, uh, uh, your, uh, you, uh, you just 10x your time right there. By outsourcing those other, uh, now I don't say menial, but this is less uh, productive or less important to to you having an effective business. Totally, totally. And and, and again, it, it's not a question like you said of you know menial or not important. It's it's what's the most leveraging. And so I love doing that exercise with my clients that you just said because I because then people realize okay, well you know in that scenario he just freed up five hours by hiring a cleaning service. So now the question is okay. How can I leverage these five hours to focus on generating revenue, money, right? Anytime I offshore something or outsource it, it's because I want to focus on things that actually affect the bottom line. And so when I get my clients to do that, I, I find it's, it's such an easy win, such a quick traction because A, it shows my value in the business as a coach right away, but also for them, the light goes off and they say, wow, I just offloaded five hours of something that I either didn't care for or felt like a drag or wasn't giving me return. And I now just spent that prospecting, 
networking, building relationships, and this is the result. And it becomes addictive for people. They, they I mean, I, I, I'm sure all business owners, we can speak to that, right? You, you get a win, you know, a new client comes in, you see sales are up and you're like, okay, well, I've seen this as possible. Can we do more? And so getting people in that, that success, you know, seeing wins perspective by doing this is so, so crucial. I think it's really, really essential to the entrepreneurial journey. I'm glad you also said that as well. One of, one of the things I do I talk about is that uh, you need to focus on your wins and not your losses. Because let me ask you this. And I'm going to ask you this, Matthew, but pretend you're just an average uh, a potential client. Let's say uh, that, that potential client comes to you and they say, and they gave you 19 wins that happened today. And then they talk, and then one, one negative thing happens. What do they usually talk about? The 19 wins or the one negative? Yeah, the one negative. For sure. For sure. And so and, the thing is, you need to celebrate your wins and don't focus on, on the negative. Because the more you focus, in my opinion, the more you focus on the negative, the more negative is going to happen to you. Oh, so focus and, on your wins. And, and this is where I know that, you know, you and I as coaches, I think we have a responsibility and a job to just help people reframe their perspective, right? That's really, I love to tell my clients to say, you're not hiring me to be an expert. You're the expert in your domain. You're bringing me on to help you find your blind spots to help you think of better ways to optimize and move this forward. You know, I was talking to one of my clients about this very thing uh, this past week. And, you know, she has been on, on the um, scaling up and bringing people on and systemizing things that, you know, she's been a client for 14 months. They've seen some tremendous gains already. But recently she brought somebody on for a department and she said, she was like, oh my gosh. She's like, I feel like this is not going well. It's a failure. And I'd said, okay, well, like, but that feels really, really extreme to me. Can you, can you kind of quantify it? And so I had her like list off what's been a win and what's not. And so I said, you know, would you feel like out of a hundred percent that she's, you know, that this person you've brought on, that they're struggling 35, 40% of the time. And she was like, yeah, that's probably what I would say. And I said, that means that they're winning 60 or 65% of the time. Think about that. Right. Almost two thirds of what you're giving them, they're succeeding on and they just started. We can only go up from here. And in that moment, she started to realize she was like, wow, my mindset is really off, right? I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, the 35, 40% fail, you know, should we, you know, go in another direction? Should we reassign this person? And I think that, again, as coaches, we have this opportunity to reframe things, not just to be positive or for the sake of, you know, let's all put a smile on our face and pretend nothing's happening. We get to reframe things for people and see you're actually doing better than you think. And here's the clarity needed for us. Here's our baseline. Let's grow from here. And, I, and I, I'm not a, a big baseball fan, but are, are you a baseball fan? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, unfortunately so. I'm a, I'm a big Toronto Blue Jays fan. Now, now, what is it in baseball? Is it what, uh, RBIs, runs batted in, or or uh, uh, getting hits to get on base? So for a baseball player that has, say, a 20% uh, a ratio, that's considered yeah, phenomenally uh, phenomenally good. And so that means they're failing 80% of the time. They're probably failing 85% of the time, and they're still considered very good. So the thing is, you, you can't look at those those failures because, like you just said, the person was was sixty five percent successful. These people are eighteen percent successful, and they're getting paid millions of dollars. Context matters, and so for that for that person, that client, even to just have the conversation and say, a year ago you were complaining about this thing, and now someone else is doing sixty percent of the work, and then the light bulb went off. Like, oh yeah, a year ago I I had to do all this. And now I freed up 60% of my time. Sure, we still have things to work on. We still have things we can get better on. But I just freed off 60% of this task. And for her to sit back, now she's encouraged to say, okay, we can keep going and let's try this again because obviously getting my time back is really, really leveraging for the business. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad that you shared that with us. Uh, so uh, Matthew, if some people that are, who are listening to the show, they, you know, they're liking, they're, they're resonating with you. What is the one of the, what are some of the best ways for them to, to get a hold of you? Do you have a, a scheduling calendar page, a, a landing page, a website, an email? How, how, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, but best ways to get a hold of me is my company is called Prime Consulting. So you can go to consultingbyprime.com. So consultingbyprime.com. Check out the website. 
or you can look me up on LinkedIn or Instagram. Would love to connect with you. Matthew Sinjari, S-A-N-J-A-R-I. So consultingbyprime.com or Matthew Sinjari on LinkedIn or Instagram. Love to connect with you. Well, thank you for sharing that. And before we go, is there anything else that you would like to, any last things or any last ahas that you would like to uh, share with uh, our guests today? Yeah, uh, uh, honestly, I, I just love to encourage people. You know, I, I, I know it's cliche and I know that, you know, you can listen to podcasts and we all have our personal development, but I try and always get my clients and really the people in my life to remember why they started, right? Remember your why. Simon Sinek's got a great book on it. Uh, excellent thought leader, but just this idea to remember your why, right? For me, my why has always been people. And so that's why I said, it doesn't matter the skin of what I'm doing at the end of the day, marketing, real estate, you know, coaching, my why is people. And that why reminds me that when things are tough, when I don't want to keep going, when my coach and my mentors give me advice that I don't feel like following <laughs> and I'm a little resistant to, I remember that I can push through in those moments and that I can keep going because I have a why. And as long as that why is really big and worth it, that I'm always going to keep pushing. And so I just, I want to encourage everybody listening, entrepreneurs, business owners, leaders, employees, if you've got a why and you can rem remind yourself of that why, you're going to remember to celebrate. You're going to remember to keep pushing through. And you're just going to remember at the end of the day, why you're really doing what you're doing. And, and that is extremely powerful. Actually, I have start with why by Simon Sinek. And it is signed by him before he became famous. He was at, at, at an event. So that's one, of, that's one of my books that I, uh, that I treasure. And there's, there's a thing I, I, I want to share with, you, uh, with your, uh, with the audience, because you said this, is a lot of people have heard of things called smart goals. I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard of a smart goal. And uh, now I don't like using smart goals because I don't think they're strong enough. So in my third, in my second book, I actually came up with a, a what I call a smart T goal. S M A R R T Y. So it has to be specific, specific, measurable, attainable. Most uh, most people that hear smart goals, they hear the word other uh, R as meaning relevant. And I, I learned it as meaning risky. You have to be willing to do something different. And, you, and that involves taking a risk. T is going to be your time constraint. And then the last letter is by far the most important of the, uh, of the SMART uh, goal system. And that's the letter Y, which stands for your why. Because it's your why that's going to drive you. And I'll, I'll give you an example for me. Back in 2010, I weighed 240 pounds. I don't know what the equivalence to kilograms is, but it was 240 pounds. And I and in about two and a half two two and a half months, I was going to my high my twenty five year high school reunion, and I wanted to I wanted to look good. I was actually even taking an ex girlfriend of mine that I met after high school uh, to my reunion, so I hadn't seen her in a few years. So I said, okay, I want to get from two forty to one seventy. So my it was specific, it was measurable because it was a scale attainable seventy pounds in ninety days. That's that's that that's that, that's a hard one. Um, I, I will say this, I did get down to 180. So I did lose 60 pounds in 90 days. Uh, the first R, was it relevant? Yes, it was relevant for my self-esteem, looking good on stage, looking good at my reunion. So, and so the, the, those are the, 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 that was the relevant, re relevance. Was it risky? That would mean going on a basically a starvation diet while doing an extreme workout routine no, no, at that time known as P90X. So it was a pretty hardcore thing. And sometimes I was working out twice a day. And uh, it was, it had, and I had a time frame. Well, I was going to my high school reunion about 60, 65 days into the into the program, so, and so, and my wife was again. I wanted to look good. When I after going to the high school reunion, and I came back, you know, I still had thirty more days to go. Why do you think the last thirty days was by far the hardest? Yeah, I, it was I mean, very hard for me on the last thirty days. Because I, I, I was the, the reason I finished was because I was already on a on, on a roll, and I wanted to hold true to myself. But you, do you know why the, the last 30 days was the hardest? Yeah, I, I'd imagine you were doing everything for that event. You wanted to look good for the event. Once the event passed, that motivation or that incentive severely decreased. My why was gone. Yep, yeah. that was exactly it. So that is how, how important it is to have a why. And it has to be a motivating why. Is there, it can't be, I want to have a million dollars to the bank because I, I just want to have a million dollars to the bank. Like, well, that's not a strong enough why. You know, because the, the, the money is going to buy you something else. It's going to buy you your confidence, you know, whatever it's going to buy you. So your why has to be a motivating factor. It can't be something just made up. And I would say this to you, uh, and Matthew, if you came up to me and said, hey, this is my why, probably the first thing I'm going to say is BS. Tell me the real why. And I'll keep telling you that's BS. 
give me the real why. And then once you start digging into it, and then you would discover like, that's my why. Like, I can give this as an example. I was taking a class and we were talking about uh, goal setting. And one of the guys says, I want to be able to uh, take my uh, have, take my ring finger, my wedding ring off my pinky ring and put it on the on there. And his wife was sitting next to me. And, and, uh, and, I, and I looked at him, I go, that's BS. What? I, I don't I, I don't buy it and he just he looked at me kind of like uh, uh, astonished and go and go that is not your why he goes the, he, he took the finger uh, he took the ring off he goes I want to see my, my, my I want to see my kids graduate college and get married and if I keep all this weight on I'm not going to do that like there's your why your, your wife sitting next to you is a good part of it but it's not the real why yeah yeah no it, it's so good and so essential and and again I I think that the, the sooner we drive to that and the more we can live in reality, which I think sometimes can be really hard for us as business owners and entrepreneurs because we want to live in the fantasy of the big idea, and the big amounts and the big, big goals. Like if we can live in that reality, then we have, and I keep using the word baseline, this baseline that we can operate from. And the sooner we get to that why, the quicker we can actually move forward from it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, Matthew, again, thank you for all the great knowledge that you shared with us. Uh, any last words before we go? I, I know everybody asked you this question. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it one more time because I want, I want to make sure we leave on a high note where you're, you, where you're talking with the guests. No, no, absolutely. Just to, thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Uh, just a pleasure to be on. Well, thank you, Matthew. And everybody, if anybody that, uh, that's uh, listening to the show right now, I think they would like to be a guest on the show. If they know somebody that might be might be a good guest for the show, go ahead and set, uh, sign up for a pre-interview. It's a 15-minute pre-interview. You will just go to businessamplified.net forward slash uh, uh, four slash pre-interview, no dash. So again, business, amplify.net, four slash uh, pre-interview. Uh, and all the other websites that uh, that Matthew uh, gave uh, from his LinkedIn page to his uh, his um, his, his coaching business will all be in the notes below. And again, everybody, thank you for joining us on the show. And we'll, until next time, be amazing. Thanks for tuning in to another empowering episode of Business Amplified with Kevin A. Dunlap. If you found value in today's insights, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the podcast. Keep amplifying your business. And remember, your success journey is our inspiration. Until next time on Business Amplified, go out there and make your business thrive.